All right, welcome to our final video in this section where I talk about anomalies and multi-factor models. So in this video, I'm going to discuss why models evolved beyond what you see with the CAPM uh, to get, say, three-factor models, four-factor models, five-factor models. Uh, so basically, I'm going to talk about the issues with the CAPM. I'll then show you some of the most well-known anomalies, anomalies that you need to know about before you go out into the work environment. And then we'll look at how researchers have constructed these models, uh, these APT models in recent years. So let's get started. All right, so I'll start off with a lot of well-known problems with the CAPM. Uh, these are just the most important ones, some I, I'm not going to touch on, but uh, first off, as you might remember, we use historical data to estimate betas. We then use those betas to calculate expected returns, and we see how much explanatory power the CAPM has. The problem is that we're using the S&P 500 index as our measure of the market. When we say the market, though, we're referring to the entire market, not just the U.S. stock market. There's all kinds of assets in other markets uh, that are not adequately accounted for, like uh, commodities, real estate, stamps, coins, uh, you know, etc. Uh, because we can't accu accurately capture the market using a single measure, we can't ever know that the CAPM is able to accurately predict stock returns. Uh, this, I would call it a catch-22. This is what we call Rolls critique, named after the famous financial economist Richard Roll, who stated it in the 1980s. Uh, you know, so basically, Richard Roll, his critique says you can't measure the market and therefore you can't ever know if the CAPM is working or not. Next, it's well known that historically low beta stocks have higher returns than expected by the CAPM, and high beta stocks have lower returns than predicted by the CAPM. Uh, there are several possible explanations for this, which uh, you'll see this anomaly in a few seconds, but uh, basically one of the best explanations for this well-known early anomaly is that some institutional investors like mutual funds are not allowed to hold assets like junk bonds or non-investment grade bonds. Uh, therefore, they tend to over-invest in high beta stocks, which pushes the price up and the future returns on those stocks down. Uh, that's the assessment of several researchers, including the researchers whose work you're going to see in a few seconds, Frasini and Peterson. Uh, if you want to see that analysis, I'll leave it in the references section of our slides. Next, most investors are not able to borrow and lend at the risk-free rate, or short securities. Uh, this means there's market frictions, and these investors are less likely to be able to profit on valuable information. These frictions make the market less efficient and less able to price in new information. Next, we're assuming that beta is constant from one period to the next. However, a stock's beta can change dramatically through time, uh, especially if the firm is changing its operations. Uh, the historical beta might also not reflect the future beta. I mean, we're relying on historical data. So the, the beta that we're estimating using, let's say, five years of monthly data is the beta over that five-year period. It's not necessarily the beta of the firm moving forward. Finally, beta might not be our only measure of risk. There could be other risk factors besides market risk that investors are taking into account, and those risk factors could influence the share price. With all these problems that the CAPM has, it's understandable uh, for someone to believe there might be a way for some securities with specific characteristics to outperform the market. When we find a security's return outperforms or underperforms the expected return calculating using the CAPM, this is what we sometimes refer to as a market anomaly. Uh, we find market anomalies when securities have specific characteristics uh, that lead to, say, either a very positive or a very negative alpha. Uh, the alpha is statistically significantly different from zero. Uh, one of these, I mean, what you're looking at right here are a list of some very famous anomalies. Uh, I mentioned bet betting against beta a few seconds ago, but we do also have things like the book to market, I aka the value anomaly. We have the size anomaly, momentum anomaly. Uh, basically, what these anomalies indicate is that there is some factor, like the book to market ratio, that when you sort all stocks on that factor, 
what you find is that some stocks outperform what the CAPM, CAPM predicts. So in this case, stocks with high book to market ratios outperform stocks with low book to market ratios. Or with respect to the betting against beta anomaly, uh, low beta stocks outperform uh, what they're expected to based on the CAPM. In other words, low beta, low beta stocks have uh, positive alphas and high beta stocks have negative alphas. Now, there's a lot of these anomalies out there. Uh, if you want a more full list, there's finally a Wikipedia page that kind of keeps track of these anomalies that are identified in top financial journals, uh, 130, but there's definitely more than that that have been identified over the last 40 years. I've just listed the five most famous. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these in turn. We'll start off with the betting against beta anomaly. So I mentioned that CAPM was developed in the 60s. Uh, the betting against beta anomaly was first discovered or mentioned by these three research researchers, Black, Jensen, and Scholes, in the early 70s. And this is a graphical interpretation of what they found. Basically, if we plot the security market line, what you can see is that when we sort securities into different portfolios, the portfolios with the low beta securities have positive alphas and the the portfolio with the highest beta on average has negative alpha a negative alpha so that's true for each of these things uh, so i mean this is betting against beta uh, a set of researchers named uh, frazzini and peterson they did some follow-on analysis and they found that this anomaly still persists i mean basically they sort the entire market or all stocks into 10 deciles or 10 portfolios and they look at uh, the portfolios by beta. Basically we have 10 portfolios of stocks. This portfolio right here represents the low beta stocks. This portfolio over here represents the high beta stocks or the, you know, the top 10% of stocks based on beta. And we can see the cap M alphas. Notice here that, uh, we have statistical significance. This is a T statistic that you're seeing right here. Uh, what it indicates is that uh, this monthly cap M alpha of 52 basis points is statistically significantly different from zero. That T stat, I mean, a significant T stat would be something like 1.96. This is 6.3. So it indicates that absolutely these low beta stocks offer positive alphas. How much positive alpha? 52 basis points a month. That's enormous. I mean, to put that in annual terms, these stocks are outperforming what the CAPM is predicting by, oh, about 6% per year. Uh, whereas the, the highest beta stocks, they're underperforming, although that's not statistically significant. Uh, this is our, our T stat and it's, it's not different from zero or it's, it indicates this thing is not different from zero. Okay, so that's betting against beta. Next, let's take a look at the liquidity anomaly. Now, the liquidity anomaly is, uh, well, I guess I should define liquidity. Basically, liquidity refers to the ease and the speed with which an asset can be sold at fair market value. Because the trading costs are higher for illiquid stocks, investors should demand more before they hold these securities. That's the basic idea behind what's called the illiquidity premium. Uh, we measure the illiquidity premium using the bid ask spread or rather ask minus bid divided by the share price. Uh, so basically what this illiquidity premium indicates is that stocks with high bid ask spreads scaled by the stock price should offer higher returns than stocks with low bid ask spreads scaled by the share price. Uh, there's a very famous research paper out there in 1986 by Amahood and Mendelssohn, and that's really the first evidence that we see of this anomaly. Basically, they find a positive relationship between bid ask, bid ask spread and stock returns. Uh, so uh, I, I guess that's that's pretty much it. So let's take a look at this thing. So I pulled the data provided by Amahood and Mendel Mendelssohn from 1986, and I wanted to put it in a nice fancy chart. So what they've done if, is they've sorted stocks into seven portfolios based on bid ask spread, or rather uh, ask lowest asking price minus high, highest bid price divided by the share price. So these stocks up here have the highest bid ask spread. 
These stocks in this portfolio right here have the lowest bid ask spread. So they're the most liquid. So this portfolio right here is going to contain the stocks of you know, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, Netflix, all the big stocks that are frequently traded. Uh, notice here that the excess returns on this portfolio are significantly lower than the excess returns on this portfolio. In essence, uh, illiquid stocks offer higher returns than liquid stocks do. So this is the famous bid-ask or illiquid illiquidity premium, if you want to think of it that way. All right, now, because there are so many different anomalies out there, like the, the illiquidity anomaly or the uh, betting against beta anomaly, uh, what ended up happening in the 1980s was that a lot of researchers started considering that they could add factors to the CAPM to improve its predictive abilities. Uh, so these models where we add factors to the CAPM are what we sometimes call arbitrage pricing theory models or APT models. Uh, what these models do is they, they use a bunch of predictors uh, that could predict future stock returns. And these predictors are very often macroeconomic factors. Uh, so APT models, most of the time, they're just going to add factors to the cap M. Uh, you know, these could be like uh, change in GDP. So this factor one could be change in GDP. Factor two could be uh, interest rates during the period. Factor three could be unemployment during the period. Uh, there are many, many different APT models out there. Uh, if you can create a factor, uh, just some variable that changes from month to month or you know period to period, you can create a new APT model. Uh, the goal here of these APT models is to predict excess returns on stocks. Now, there are a lot of famous APT models out there. Uh, one of the older and I would say the most famous APT models out there is the Fama and French three-factor model. Now, these two researchers, Gene Fama and Ken French, they took some variables that had already been identified as anomalous, and they used them to construct two additional factors. They called these factors the small minus big factor and the high minus low factor. And uh, let me just show you how this is created, because I'll show you the regression form of the model in a second. But basically, they used the value factor and the size factor, and they sorted all stocks into one of six bins. So based on the book to market ratio of the stock and the, the market cap of the stock. So, uh, you know, small cap stocks are going to go in these three bins and large cap stocks are going to go in these three bins. Uh, value stocks, stocks with high book to market ratios are going to go in this bin and the bottom 30% of stocks based on book to market ratio are going to go in this bin. And what these researchers did was they created factors by taking uh, the, well, to get the small minus big factor, or SMB factor, they took the returns on the stocks, the small stocks, minus the return on the big stocks uh, during the period, and that's their size factor. The high minus low factor, they basically took the returns of uh, these, fa these stocks, uh, and subtracted the return of these stocks. And, you know, they created this, this value factor called the high minus low or HML factor. Now, these are the forms of the three-factor model, the Fama and French three-factor model. Up here, we have the regression form of the three-factor model, which says that the excess return on a given stock is equal to alpha plus or beta with respect to the market times the market risk premium plus the beta with respect to the si the small minus big or size factor times the size factor, uh, plus the beta times uh, with respect to the value factor times the value factor, or HML factor, plus some error term. The model form is just, I mean, it's, it's basically the model form of the cap M, which is basically everything from where my cursor is over, plus two additional factors. And that's really all these APT models are. They're just adding additional factors most of the time to the cap M to see if they can improve the prediction ability of that model. Now, there are other APT models out there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'll just, I've listed three of the most famous. So, you know, one of the early famous ones was 
uh, created by some researchers, Chen, Roll, and Ross. Uh, it's a five-factor model. Uh, there's another one out there that's a four-factor model. We call it the Carhartt model. It's basically uh, the Fama and French three-factor model with a momentum factor on it. And then Fama and French, they saw that some other researchers had identified anomalous variables. They took those anomalous variables, added those variables to their three-factor model to create a new five-factor model. So uh, basically, they're just taking previously identified anomalies and building models with them. Now, I, I guess the final point I want to leave here, uh, why would we ever want to do this? Why would we want to create these additional factor models, these APT models? Well, adding factors to the model is going to improve model accuracy. It's going to improve the R squared of the model. Uh, anytime you add a factor to any kind of regression model uh, or additional explanatory variable, it's going to increase the, the R squared of the model and hopefully it'll increase the adjusted R squared. Uh, and we can use these APT models to determine whether or not some anomaly is actually an, an anomaly. If every investor is pricing in, let's say, a value factor or the small minus big factor, we should control for that. And once we control for that, if some anomalous variable is no longer anomalous, meaning it no longer has a significantly uh, positive or negative alpha, what that says is that it's it's really not an anomaly. It's it's just some artifact of the data. Uh, so uh, we'll work with these factor models, I, I would say almost guaranteed in class, but it's important to know that these exist and they've existed for 30 or I guess in some cases, I guess uh, 30 plus years. So they are important and they're basically expansions on the CAPM because the CAPM has a lot of failings. All right, so let's summarize. The CAPM has many problems. The you know most notable is going to be roles critique, but we have things like the fact that the betas are based on historical data and don't reflect the current amount of market risk associated with the firm. Uh, we also know that there are a huge number of anomalies out there. I mean, feel free to click on that Wikipedia page and see over a hundred of them. Uh, basically, anomalies are any variable that when you sort all stocks on it, uh, offers a, a either a positive or a negative alpha uh, that's statistically significantly different from zero. We do have some very prominent, well-known anomalies like the, the size anomaly, the book-to-market or value anomaly, momentum anomaly, the liquidity anomaly. I only touched on uh, four anomalies in this video. I didn't get to momentum, but uh, you know we can talk about that in class. Uh, and then also there's a lot of other factor models or APT models that usually use the cap M as a base and then add on some prediction variables to try and uh, add explanatory power to the model. So with that, I'm going to close out. If you're interested, here's the uh, major papers I whose researcher research I discussed. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.